Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. I decided that since we only got three verses in chapter 8, that uh, I just begin back at chapter 8, verse uh, 1. But before I go there, any questions or comments before we uh, get into uh, chapter 8? Questions from anywhere, from anyone? Going once, going twice, Thank too late. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Church. Please consider what? sending us an email at info that at friendshipgracebrennan.com sure? to let us this teaching may have helped you. Please also okay, we're, we're in a section that is titled uh, God Should Be First and uh, Idolatry in the Temple. Just south of the intersection and of the this is really um, a section that includes Ezekiel's second vision or experience, um, but this time it's in the temple in Jerusalem. So we'll have an occasion where Ezekiel is moved in time and space back to, uh, to Jerusalem. Remember, he's actually physically in Babylon, but God takes him to the temple. So chapter 8, verse 1 in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me. The hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. Um, again, this is one of those uh, specific dating verses that tells us that uh, this was actually September 19th, 592 B.C. When you translate the date reference that he gives, because references in this time period are very accurate because we have lots of corroborating sources we're able to translate it into um, into our calendar so September 19th 592 BC or 413th day of the siege of Jerusalem you said that September the 19th yep September the 19th I put the 11 well that was another day in infamy but not that day Okay. <laughs> well, under house arrest, the Jewish leadership in exile would come to his place and talk to him and ask him for direction, ask him for what he sees, what his insights are, what he hears from God, and so forth. Verse uh, 1 concludes with a really interesting statement. While Ezekiel was sitting in his home in exile, he says, The hand of the Lord fell on me there. Several Old Testament scholars view this as being more than a visual experience, seeing it more as a physical experience. I'm, I'm in the minority thinking that these are all physical things where God transports in time and space. But in this instance, a lot of the uh, uh, scholars believe that this, the verbiage that he uses requires it to be more than just a, uh, a vision, more than just a, a dream, but something that he physically sees and hears. And I'm gratified that uh, so many scholars agree with me there. <laughs> then I looked and behold, a form that had a, the appearance of a man, Below what appeared to be his waist was fire, and above his waist was something like the appearance of brightness, um, like gleaming metal. This goes back to Ezekiel 1, 26, 27, right? Well, it, it, is, it is another picture. Whether it is the same picture is left to our imagination. There's, there's no direct reference to, to what he saw initially. It's just a similar sight. Yeah, because the wording is, I don't know. Ezekiel uh, was transported. He sees what appears to be a man, and the man appeared to be have fire around his waist and his upper body ra radiant like gleaming metal. Ezekiel's description of this figure um, seems to be like the figure seen in the previous vision. That's what you were talking about, Linda. Whether yeah. this is intentional by Ezekiel or not, it's... Uh, whether, whether it's the same character or not, we don't know. Whether it is the same 
a description exactly or not. You know, you're describing something. Describe a car to somebody that's never seen a car. You can do that with only so many words. And so Ezekiel is bound by the constraints of his vocabulary. And so he's, whether or not the actual sight is identical to what he saw, he's using similar words because that's all the words. How do you describe a, a guy on fire? But a guy on fire. I mean, right? There, there's very little ways that you can actually do it. And so there could be a whole range of differences that he just doesn't have the vocabulary to, uh, to say it differently. And that's not his limitation. That's the limitation of Hebrew. We have thousands and thousands of words in the English language. You know, for, for just about anything, we have multiple words. In Hebrew, not so much. So he, he's limited by that. He put out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my head. I just love that. He grabbed me by the head and drug me. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north where was the seat of, uh, the, seat of the image of jealousy which provoked, provokes to jealousy. This man with fire around his waist and brightly gleaming put out a hand to Ezekiel and, as, and then transported Ezekiel in time and space to Jerusalem. So that Ezekiel is over the sky of Jerusalem. Then Ezekiel brought, uh, was brought to the gateway of the inner court that faces to the north. Ezekiel describes that he was taken by the hand and carried between heavens, between the heavens and the earth, which is sometimes used to describe this the sky where birds fly. Ezekiel was transported through this form, or through this from Babylon to Jerusalem. And he describes he was brought to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north. This gate was one of three gates which would permit going from the outer court to the inner court of the temple complex. Ezekiel's description fits that he was standing in the outer court looking south toward the inner court of the temple complex. Ezekiel also describes that he was an idol of uh, the, that he was an idol of jealousy that provokes jealousy. In verse five, he calls the idol of jealous. Uh, he in verse five he calls it the idol of jealousy. The idol violated the second commandment, which is, um, "Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Let them not know, or let them know the abominations of their fathers." That is the wrong verse. Oh, because I put Ezekiel 20, not Exodus 20. Duh. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water of the earth or under the earth. So Ezekiel is, is saying that there's an idol, something that distracts us from God, and it's an idol that makes God jealous. Now that's an interesting phrase that we've encountered in our studies before because we, we always look at jealousy as a bad thing. And typically it is in our, in our way of doing things. But how do you suppose the Bible could properly say God is jealous? Without it being a sin. Right, because you can't, you shouldn't have other gods before me. How does that translate to jealousy? And how does that not become then God committing a sin if the way we understand jealousy is a sin? The way we understand jealousy is, is selfish. It's, it's about us. It's not about God. And God as creator has the right to demand us to be loyal to him. Yeah, we use jealousy in a way that is in error most of the time, or, or is viewed in error most of the time. Um, he is so passionate about his love for his people that he wants 
constant commune with them. And when they go after other gods, whether they are real or not, and they're not, um, they he he is jealous. He he craves the the companionship of his people. I don't know if that made any sense. It made a lot more sense in my mind. Well, maybe, like, would it be more of a like God when not the the angry reaction that we have when when we experience jealousy, but does it make him maybe makes God feel sad? Yeah. That that his people are have gone astray. Yeah, when you than the anger that when, well, when that you he, think why he created in the first place. Yes. When, he when you created think, for us to praise him. And, right. And 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 not just him. it's not just to praise him, but to right. fellowship with him. Yeah. And when then we have other things that prevent us from doing that, which is what an idol is, he then is craving that. Not that he responds in in anger, as Anne said, but that he responds out of I really want to have the, the commune with you. That that's the sense in which God is jealous of of our attention. Does that jealousy ever reach the point of anger or discipline? Because in in our in, in humanly speaking, almost always jealousy leads to either anger or revenge or some sort of a physically negative retribution of some sort. Retaliation. Yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah. It can't ever be for God that he responds out of anger. Because responding out of anger is sin. So we have to view how God responds. Um, do, does God get angry? Yes. But not anger like we have. This is a righteous anger. Yeah. And, and that, that's a... That's a that's a theologically normal statement that isn't understood by most people. It's not um, understood by me. <laughs> it, 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 it's, no, but he, it, according to everything that he has put down as a law or guidance, has driven to the point of anger because it wasn't fulfilled, which was perfect. So it's righteous, right? Well, yeah, that's that's perhaps a, a good way to view it, but it, it's much broader than that. God's God's emotions do not drive him um, as we would be driven. He can't be driven to sin. He can't sin. He can't violate his own character. And so does God's jealousy ever drive him to anger not in the way that we would be angry. God has, has, uh, as Linda said, Linda with an I, has the the right to our companionship, be and our worship and our praise because He created us. Um, and gave us the rules of the road to correct live life. And. Adam knew that, and he chose to disobey really quick. Um, some scholars want Adam to have been in the garden for a long time before he sinned. If he made it a day, I'm surprised. But, but he was he was innocent of that because he wasn't told. It came down to the sin of having been forewarned with knowledge that what he was doing was wrong. No, you don't have to be warned to have it as sin. But he was told. He was told what to do, and he chose not to do it. God said to Adam, you can eat from any tree you want, but this particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can't eat from that. And so what did the serpent 
lure Eve to do, and then lure Eve lure Adam to do. Eat from that tree. So if he could have sinned without any knowledge of his sin, then why didn't God come down and kick him out then? Because why he, did he wait? Well, because he, it was his first sin. When, he when, didn't know it was his first sin. What? He, Say that. he evidently couldn't have known it was his first sin. Not God, but Adam. If he hadn't been told and he didn't know he had sinned, Ignorance is not a is not a defense, and well, he and, was told. and he was told right. He was told what not to do, and that's about what he did. I'm sorry. About the tree. Right. What other sin did he commit? I don't know. You said he probably committed one the first day. Right. So I'm going why eating the fruit. Stopping eating the fruit is the first sin. Oh, you think? You think that was the first sin? Well, you was. You said he probably committed sins before that. No, I didn't say that. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, I totally missed. Can you yeah, your your, your headset's on backwards or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sandy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, he. I think he sinned the first day, and I think the sin is the fact that that he 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 followed his wife's leading. To do what God said not to do. And Satan... But, wait, wait, wait. Wasn't God having walked with him in the cool of the day? Yeah. And that would have become a custom? Well, what's so a custom? Been, well, more than one day, I would think. But, either way, he got past the first... Never mind. <laughs> don't get hang, hung up on the on whether it's the first or the five thousandth day because we don't know. No. The only reason I say it's the first day, it was real early because what was the other command God gave Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply. No babies were conceived in the garden. They were only conceived after sin. So if God said be fruitful and multiply, I'm I'm suspecting that they consummated their relationship early, early on. That's the way I would argue that. What brings you to that conclusion? To the conclusion that no, no babies were, were uh, created in the garden? That they, they cohabitated early on. Because they were told by God to be fruitful and multiply, have babies. Well, maybe they didn't. Well, that's that, that's true. Maybe they didn't, or or so that would have been a second sin, right? Because God said, "Do it." Well, maybe they. <laughs> okay, we can go on with this dialogue, but we won't. <laughs> right. I guess I I guess I'm surprised I'm at at that I'm not clear or something. <laughs> it's okay. it's just. I think you're just uh, ruffling the feathers of things that nobody's ever really considered or thought. <laughs> Go ahead, Chuck. It never, it it never mattered. Matter. Bear the fruit or do what they were supposed to do. Yeah, it just never mattered to me whether it was the first or the 130,000 yeah. day. <laughs> Go, Go ahead, Chuck. Go ahead, Chuck. I'm trying to think my way through the beginning part of Genesis. <laughs> You've done it once or twice in your life. What yeah. is the basis of no conception in the garden? How do we know that? Because if 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 what we assume from Scripture that the and I'm going to use a term that's not necessarily um, biologically or medically correct, but if we assume the sin gene comes from Dad. Then, okay. then consummation before the fall would have meant that the first baby or the first babies would have been perfect without the sin nature. Yep. And we yep. know that not to be the case. But maybe those are the wives that the latter boys married. No, they married their sisters. Yeah. And all I can say is I'm glad I wasn't in that era. <laughs> okay. so what we Thank you, Rick. Is, what we now know is that the Garden of Eden was in Arkansas. Oh, exactly. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, no, they would have gotten frosted. Apparently they're sitting there, Rich. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Said he didn't have to. Yeah. That just brings up all sorts of new deliverance themes to me. <laughs> oh, dear. As we carry on. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. My 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 semi scholarly approach to early Genesis argues that Adam and Eve sinned early on because they didn't have any children that did not have or that that were not perfect. They all their children had the sin um, nature, and uh, and so that had to be early on in their existence. And uh, because Adam fell in perfection. I would argue that he did it quickly and not not uh, not uh, lingered in uh, in the garden a long time. So the kids were conceived after the fall. Yes. Yes. Because they had a sin nature, and the only way that could have happened is that it happened after the fall. But Adam and Eve had a sin nature, and they were from the very beginning. Right? No, they did not have a sin nature until they sinned. It, caused, it was the because of the nature that she was lured into it. Is no, that not correct? no, no, no. Hmm. Go back That's and read right. chapter 1 of Genesis. And at the end of each day of creation, God said it is good. And what does that mean? It is perfect. It is exactly what I wanted. And so Adam and Eve were created. They weren't. Neither of them were born. They were created. Right. We could go down a whole other rabbit trail if you want, uh, whether or not they had belly buttons. But they they were they were created without the sin nature, and then when Adam sinned, he had the sin nature. What's that tell you about the sin? <laughs> I didn't have COVID till I got it, right? Well, that's exactly right. What's that tell you about the sin nature? It's catching. <laughs> go ahead, Ann. You don't have it until you sin. Right. But we all have it because he's our federal head, but it doesn't make you sin. The sin so nature he does not make you he sin. He tried but had no children. Okay. What, what's that? He tried but had no children, so he didn't sin. Oh. You you could argue you could argue that without any without any substance, just like I'm arguing my point without any substance. I don't like your point. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Rich, Rich if if the um, pr chronology follows uh, chapter three, which is the fall mm -hmm. of man, and chap the events of chapter four follow that. Genesis 4 1 says, Now man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. So that rather go. strongly to me implies that you're that it's correct that they didn't have a rela sexual relationship until after they sinned. Right. Yes. Which, I, which I believe then argues for an early departure from the garden. Sure. Mm -hmm. As in verse 23 of Genesis 3, so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden. Yep. Oh, no, wait. And he drove the man out of the place on the east side of the garden of Eden. Right. So, that's, there you go. That's post-sin. He was driven well, out, and left, then he started having babies. So he left Eve in the garden? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rich, we're sorry. It's a good night. Hey, Linda, I could really mess you up and tell you that uh, many Jews believe that Eve was not Adam's first wife. Oh, I know. And they even well, have yeah, a name I'm, for that's not Lilith. Wife. That's yeah. Lilith. That's right. Yeah. Lilith is the wife. Lilith. According to, to uh, Jews, there is nothing, repeat, nothing in Scripture to substantiate that or even hint at that. Correct. And if we were to argue that that Adam had a, a previous wife, then we have all sorts of other problems with Scripture. Oh, but maybe that's where the girls came from. No. The girls were sisters. You live in Arkansas. You should be understanding of that. Now listen, son. I'm smarter than the average Eve. But, um, yeah, no, it's okay. I don't even know how we got here. 
<laughs> it's your fault, bitch. Uh, it's always my fault. I understand that. I think we started on God being jealous. Yeah. Yes. When sex comes in, the world gets crazy, you know. I, I always recognize and accept it's my fault. Okay. I just understand that. Then we're good. Okay, so go down to uh, to Ezekiel eight four, and we'll just con continue on. And behold, the glory of, of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the valley. So Ezekiel is, is being shown the temple. He's gone between the temple courtyards, and he sees the glory of the God of Israel. Excuse me, I got the hiccups again. Was there. The glory of the Lord is not really understood what, what's being referenced. It, we, we don't know if that's necessarily a statement of the Shekinah glory or if the temple itself is a reflection of God's glory or exactly what. Um, it can be assumed that the glory of the Lord was um, in the form of the image of a man on, on fire in the lower, lower half and gleaming brightly in the upper half. We, we don't know. This is one of those verses that... If you had 10 scholars, you'd have 12 ideas of what it means. Ezekiel looks at the temple and looks at the guy, and he's impressed by God. That's the best I can give you out of that verse. And he says, as in the vision I had seen in the plane, going back to um, Ezekiel 3.22, right? Well, right. When, when, when he sees these fantastic things... He falls down and worships, and he's impressed by God. That's that's the reference here. And because back in the the other chapter, it was and the glory of the Lord was standing there. So right, the plain and the glory and everything was. Then he said to me, "Son of man, lift up your eyes now toward the to the toward the north." So I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, north of the altar gate is the entrance was the image of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see greater abominations. So I was, I was reading a commentary by um, Adam Clark. I don't know if you approve of him or not. But I, I don't know him. Uh, it was quite interesting on how he had researched with with the uh, Israel, I don't know, scrolls and stuff. But evidently they had been worshipping around the outer edge of the courtyard was um, rooms for the priests and uh, mm -hmm. all these people to have, I guess, stay when they were on duty. Anyway, that they had painted serpents and cloven beasts and all kinds of things and they were praying to them. oh yeah we we know for a fact that the the temple by by the end of of judah's time before nebuchadnezzar sacked babel or sacked uh, jerusalem we know for a fact that the temple was full of idols including frescoes on the wall and including gold images and all sorts of of various Canaanite gods and gods from the other peoples around them. Some of it goes all the way back to Solomon. Yeah, there was some priest, I mean, some king that had gone to a, a, a land that was probably Gentile anyway, and had saw this wonderful golden altar, and he sent back to Jerusalem and had one made. Yeah. And so they really even had a golden altar. Yeah, that, that's exactly what was going on. They they had defiled the sacred altar of or the sacred temple and had made it so bad that God's jealousy now was invoked and the process was coming to an end for uh, for the Jews in Israel. 
Yeah, the, when uh, when I read all of that and heard that, I automatically thought it was the Jewish nation with their high altars and uh, under the trees and all this stuff. But man, it was right in the temple. Yeah, yeah, it was all over the place. Bad in the temple. No. Hey, Rich Clark. Clark is not a bad guy. He's um, English from the early 1800s. Um, so he'd be a contemporary with some of the, um, you know, those theologians over there. Um, yeah, I just don't know the name off the top of my head. I'm, I probably have books yeah. from him, but I just don't yeah. know. I mean, they've got it condensed into one volume, like Henry's and stuff, his commentaries. And, and that, was a, that was one I, I used in uh, Bible college from time to time. Well, I sure appreciated him because I got, I even have a culture and an architectural study Bible, and neither one of them even discussed all of that stuff. So, That's why you need multiple sources. Later on, when we get further on in Ezekiel, there's the place, there's a place where he tells, God tells Ezekiel to dig through the wall. And he sees the yes the, the hole, but, but that's further on down the road. Right. Not, not there yet. Right. Actually, I read that before. It is. It is. So God asks, Ezekiel is, is being shown these things, and God asks him a, a rhetorical question. Do you see what they're doing? The great abominations the house of Israel is committing to drive me out of the temple? Of course, God's Shekinah glory had not been in the temple for years. But he wasn't present with them anymore, and he was bringing to an end their relationship for a while. Cool. <laughs> so we can look at Isaiah um, 42 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise uh, to carved idols. He's not going to stand forever and let his chosen people follow false gods. So let me ask you a question. The principle that is established by God saying, I'm not going to let you follow um, other idols. I'm not going to allow my, the praise that is due to me go elsewhere. How do we apply that in our world today? I'd say the same way. Yeah, but most of us don't have graven images and so forth in our houses. So it could put it, be as simple as having uh, the images on a dollar bill. Well, it's, I think it's much broader than images. I know. I, What's I'm the principle saying, that we would establish in our in our life today for this? Anything that's more important to you than God is an idol. Exactly. Exactly. Anything <laughs> that keeps us from giving praise and worship to God. Um, I was I was doing my uh, devotions this morning, sitting out on the back porch. It was beautiful. I had my cup of coffee, and and I had I had listened to the the text. Then I'd listened to Tara Lee, and I was I was just sitting there thinking about that stuff. And my phone dinged like I got a message, and I stopped what I was doing, and I went to look at the message. And just as I got two or three words in the message, I said, "You can't do that." I'm, I'm, I was in the middle of, of my own little worship with God, and something distracted me. At that moment, my phone was an idol. It's that simple. And I was. Uh, a lot of times, God will call us to stay in situations that work or wherever that is very uncomfortable and it's not conducive to our desires. But. We follow him more than our own comfort, and we should quit, pick, yeah, quit jobs to take up being a servant somehow else for God. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful when we decide that we're more important. Look at what God tells uh, um, Ezekiel at the end of uh, verse six. 
God says that Ezekiel will see even greater abominations than the false gods in the temple. God being forced out of his house would not be the worst thing that Ezekiel will ever see. Think about the enormity of that statement by God. Ezekiel, you're going to see worse than this. This, this is nothing. Just get prepared. It's going to get much worse than this. Verse 7, And he brought me to the entrance of the court, and when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall. The son said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. Here you go, Linda. Yeah. Dig into the wall. So I dug in the wall, and behold, there was an entrance. And he said to me, Go in and see the vile abominations they are committing here. So God brings Ezekiel down to the court, the entrance of the court where Ezekiel could see a hole in the wall, and God says, dig up a hole. Now, these were thick walls. This was not a simple thing for Ezekiel to do. This was not plaster. This was not drywall. This was, this was, this was hard wood and, uh, and rock. Covered in gold. Well, not in the courtyard. Oh, okay. We're not on the tomb. Yeah. In, in, uh, so Ezekiel be began to dig and make the hole larger, and in doing so he discovered a secret entrance. The entrance to the court is probably the inner court, so it appeared that Ezekiel was standing in the outer court looking at the wall that separated the outer court from the inner court. Um, verse 9 and he said to me, go in and see the vile abominations that they are committing there. So Ezekiel finds the, the hidden sp excuse me, space or door, and God tells him to go through the door and see firsthand the abominations. So I went in and saw, and there engraved on the wall all around was every form of creeping things and loathsome beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. And before them stood seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, with uh, Jehazaniah, the son of uh, Shaphan, standing among them. Each had his censer in his hand, and the smoke of the Lord, or smoke of the cloud of incense, went up. Now, I want you to. We just read through this within the last couple of weeks. What does that remind you of? When. Nahab and Abihu used the improper fire, strange fire, wrong incense, or did their own thing rather than doing what God told them to do. Yeah, exactly. When Aaron's oldest, two oldest sons were DRT, when God killed them because they were offering um, unauthorized incense, whether it was a different incense or it was the right incense at the wrong place or the wrong time, we don't know. Uh, John MacArthur's book on uh, charismatic, charismatic uh, um, issues, he titled Strange Fire because of that. God killed them DRT because they were offering what they were told not to, or at a time or a place they were told not to. Yet here, we have, we have 70. What's important about the number 70 here? 70. What would become the Sanhedrin, right. And the the, the leadership, the, the most important leaders of Israel. So, absent the king, who's already in custody of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, these are the guys that are running Israel. What are they doing? They're having their little seance with all of their their idols and and uh, and frescoes on the wall and all that kind of stuff, hidden so nobody could see it. Don't miss the fact that God tells Ezekiel to dig through the wall to get to the hidden entrance. This was hidden from the world, but not from God. So when you go to play on your Ouija board, or you go to have your little seance, or... horoscope. I was just going to add that, or read your horoscope. That's, I pick on horoscopes all the time. It's the same thing thing. It's exactly the same thing that they were doing. There's I wonder where the hidden and what entrance into the temple the hidden entrance was. Did they block it off or was it always hidden or what? Well, that, th there's, there's a 
there's a lot of debate about what that could be or where that could be. But you have to remember, it had to be a fairly large room because there were 70 men in it, each with their own incense. How were they breathing? Right? Uh -huh. There had to be movement of air and so forth. So th this is a complex thing. But they were just in the, in the, my dumb head, I'm picturing that they're in the area where the, the high priest was, or was sacrificing. The problem with that is it wouldn't be hidden. I see. And so what we don't know is exactly how everything was laid out in, in Solomon's temple. We do know that below Solomon's temple, there were all sorts of catacombs and rooms and so forth. Plus, some of the walls in the temple were 8, 10, 12 feet thick. And so there's, there's some belief that some of the area was hollowed out in the walls. So we don't know. Um, there was already the elders there. They had to have gotten in somehow right. in the beginning. Right. They had to have already been there. They, they could come and go. Right. It could be as simple as a sliding wooden door that there's, looks there's, like a wall. And then there's all sorts of ways, but Ezekiel is, is told to dig for the hidden room. So we have to remember that. And so the, they, they are doing their occult practices not in the sight of everyone, but always in the sight of God. It could even have been as much as the Holy of Holies, because that is a secret room to many people, and they would never have gone in there. I mean, they they just... Could be, but I would argue that it wasn't. Yeah, I wouldn't think so either, but I mean, it could, because it was a secret room. As in most people knowing what was there. Ezekiel does recognize one of the men, Jehazaniah. He's one of the four sons of uh, Shapan who found the book of the law in the temple during the reign of Josiah. Do you remember that, uh, that story? Josiah comes king uh, very early. I think he was eight years old or something like that. Seven. And, seven. I just and, read and, and he, he, he starts the practice of beginning to follow God. And he's cleaning up the temple, having his workers clean up the temple. And they find what had been lost. The Torah. And so he says, come in and read it to me. And they, he says, we got to do this. And so there were, there were changes happening in Israel because of him. Now, the man that finds the, the Torah, the, one of his four sons is involved in this occult practice. Yeah. The changes Josiah... Uh, had made in Israel only lasted through him. Right. Right. After he, his sons didn't carry it on. Right. Well, and they never got rid of all of the outside temple, not well, idol worshiping little huts or whatever it is. Yeah, they they never really got rid of it. They 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 didn't do what God said in the conquest, and right. that led to problems like God said it would. Uh, God said, don't marry women from other nations because they'll lead you astray. Just have to look at Solomon. That's exactly what happened. And, and there were no good kings in the north. There were only a few good kings in the south. Uh, and the priests were really no better. And so we have this depravity going on that they just rejected what God was doing. They just rejected everything that God had said. Verse 12, Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, each in his room of pictures? For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said also to me, You will see still greater abominations that they commit. So this isn't even the pinnacle yet. It's going to be even worse than that. We also see in these verses that the false god... Uh, worshiping leaders um, sought to justify their uh, worship of false gods by saying that God had left them. 
So it's okay for us to worship idols because God is not with us anymore. That's the rationale that God explains to Ezekiel. This is why they did that. Because they think I left. Who left? They did. Yeah, they never really got there. I mean, there were a few that followed God, but the majority of, of the Israelites didn't. The leadership almost never did. And so it wasn't that God left them, it's that they left God. Just like we experience today. You know, that, that uh, not necessarily theolo theologically correct um, poem about uh, footprints. It's not that God left you. The irony of that thought that they needed to find other gods to protect them from their enemy, which was around, which, uh, was around them because they had already forsaken Jehovah God and the covenant with him. They caused the problem. They pushed God away. But I don't, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm any better than them. I'm sure I would have been just as horrible as they were because I can be that way now. But what I don't understand is, is that logically speaking, when you take a step back, you can see it. Were there no people with logic then that they couldn't see it? There, there, was, there, was, there, there was always a remnant, but the remnant didn't have power. And when the leadership... Almost always the leadership didn't follow God. Almost always. I mean, look look at Solomon. He's the he's the poster boy for falling off the wagon. Well look right. at David. I don't know who you are and I'm busy. Go away. <laughs> so David or I'm um, Solomon, you know, Solomon he, he starts off really good. And he and he God says, I'll give you whatever you want. And he says, well, I want wisdom. wisdom. And so God gives him wisdom and wealth. Well, but what happens? He does exactly what God told him not to do. And he gets a whole bunch of girlfriends and a whole bunch of wives, and they lead him astray. That, and, and he was the one that God gave the most wisdom to. So the rest of us schmucks have nothing. Shallow and not committed. Say that again, Sandy. Shallow, not committed to his word. Yeah. He, he used his wisdom to get even richer and yeah. to expand his um, household of ladies. No, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a true statement. You don't? Uh, no. no, because that's not wise. And to quote our dear friend Les, that ain't right. <laughs> well, what he did wasn't wise. No, it wasn't. He did, what, but he already did what God told him not to. So right. why wasn't he capable of doing that? I don't understand what you're saying. It's all right. I I grasp that you don't. It's all right. I don't get it either this time, Linda. Yeah. Oh well, the whole thing is is if he, in the end, was not doing what God told him to do, and he was out expanding and doing whatever, then how can you say he can do this sin, but he can't do that one because he's wise? Well, if he was wise, he wouldn't have done that sin. Well, that's true. And so you have to explore how God, what God gave him in wisdom and what it, what it was used for. God didn't give him the ability to pick all the lotto numbers. That's not wisdom. God gave him the ability to make right decisions. And he abandoned that. And then he had a lot of girlfriends and, and wives. Yeah. Well, that wasn't very intelligent either. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah, he, he abandoned the gift from God. There's you can't you can't spin it any other way. God gave him a tremendous gift. He could have been the greatest ever, but he didn't Was follow that. Huh? He was for a while. Yeah, he, he was, was for a while. while. Yeah. And then what happened? His women happened. Tried. No, women happened. No. Women happened. Oh. 
Come on, Chuck. I'm there. I'm. I'm I need some backup here, buddy. Uh, He's smarter than that. No, Apparently he not. That's the problem. He had the wisdom, but he didn't have the smarts. <laughs> Rich. What's that, Chuck? Man, yes. I said, your wife's in the other room. My <laughs> wife has her elbow right by my jaw. Way to go, Elaine. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the wisdom of Chuck. It may not be like Solomon's wisdom. Yeah. Smart man. But it just flabbergasts me that I'm not saying I wouldn't have done it. I'm sure I would have. I but when I sin and do these stupid things, usually I get around to the point where I go, oh, that was really dumb. And Why? I, I go back to what I'm supposed to. Why? Because God's tapping you on the shoulder. Yeah. And you listen. What's What's different between you and Solomon? The Bible. No. But the Holy Spirit was still there. The Holy Spirit did not indwell him. Correct. He did not per permanently communicate with him. There's a big difference between the church and ancient Israel. God promises Israel that will come for them in Jeremiah chapter 31 in the New Covenant. But they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's a big difference in how we should respond. We should be much better than them because the Holy Spirit is knocking on the side of our head. Sometimes the two by four. Yeah, but didn't, but often we don't in, listen. Didn't they have an indwelling to fulfill a purpose that God needed them to have, and then they did uh, not have an indwelling. The Holy Spirit would come upon them or would power them, but they did not have a permanent indwelling. And well, not permanent, but just for that purpose. Well, there's no indication that there ever was an indwelling, only a coming upon, and the words are distinctly different. Mm. What I read, I read, and I thought it was so cool because it made, finally made sense to me. Is they were clothed with, not indwelt, but clothed with. Right. And I went, oh, I get it now. When you, when you go to Jeremiah thirty-one, and you uh, you look at what they are promised, they're promised what we experience today, where we can have that kind of communication that only exists between us and God because the Holy Spirit is there and because Jesus is there interpreting. They didn't have that. And the, the, the ability to hear from God was much different. God can talk to you today differently than he talked to them then. Because God can talk to our heart today and give you direction. But God didn't talk directly to their heart. And so he had prophets speaking to them. Sometimes he had donkeys speaking to them. Sometimes he had burning bushes speaking to them. Sometimes he just came down in a theophany or a Christophany and talked to them. He doesn't do that today because he indwells us today. Their laws were on stone where today they're on our fleshy heart. Yeah, but the law is still on stone for us. The law didn't change. I'm just saying it is already written in our hearts. We don't have to have a tablet. But that's also a reference. It was it was apparent to them too. Well, only only um, mentally. I mean, when something's on your heart, it it starts affecting you emotionally also. I don't think necessarily, other than the people from the burning bush and perhaps the donkey had some kind of epiphany, but, but just to hear something read off the pages. We don't look at our Constitution today as the people did that wrote it. I mean, there was blood, sweat, and tears, and light so, some of us blood do. there. Some of us do. But mm -hmm. I, I don't expect that very many of us have the full depth that the writers get. Well, shame on us. just came out of England and around. Shame, shame on us. But what, yes. the, the point is that God communicates in different dispensations differently. Yeah, I'm glad we're in this one. Yeah, me too. But we have now what God promises to Israel that they will get in the New Covenant.
from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Uh, God talks about in writing on their heart, instilling in them, and and being able to communicate and teach each other. That was not a thing then. I wonder why God did it that way. Well, that's that's a question to put on your list of asking God when you get to sit down and talk to him. When you get to go to Jesus 101 and uh, and sit down with him, you can ask him that. My list is very long. I'm, mine isn't. I'm just going. You bet. I got lots of I got lots of questions of things that I don't understand. Okay, we're going to end there tonight because it's already three minutes after oh, eight. Oh shoot! Bang! I was I was really looking forward to the very next verse. Well, it's called a cliffhanger. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> okay, I can hang on to that clip. So we start at seven, right? Yep, we start well six time, six your time. No, I meant verse seven. Oh yeah, is yeah. that where we ended up? I wrote it down, closing my book. I don't know. Yeah. No, I think we're on. No, we, no we're way past well, that. We got to be like on fifteen or something. Verse fourteen and fifteen. Yeah, that's what yeah. that. We haven't got down to the crying. Okay, it's fourteen. Yeah, fourteen. Okay. That's where my note is. Good. I got it now. Thank Questions you, or comments? Thank you for taking your time with us tonight. Sometimes it's a challenge. I was just going to say, I love rabbit trails. I'm sorry. God oh, never promised you a rose garden. Mary's you got a bunch of women. Rabbit trails, Rich. Say that again, Chuck. What? I said, Mary hasn't been around long enough to know they're not rabbit trails. That's right. They, we, we, have, we have done gone past rabbit trails. We do hippopotamus trails. Okay. <laughs> I like hippopotamus they're, trails. They're just a little bit bigger. Just a little. Okay. No, more, no questions or other comments? My brain is still trying to, 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 to fathom going through that secret door and seeing that my brain is stuck there yeah and then god says that's really bad it's not the worst yeah like i said my brain is stuck there there was 70 of the elders yeah my brain is my brain is kaput there but then again you know i've listened to some pastors that i want to run from too so yeah, and my brain is really put thinking about the fact that it was one of uh, the sons from uh, the guy who found the scroll. Yeah. I think that as parents, we have such a huge responsibility. And I know I didn't get it quite right all the time, but oh my gosh. If ever there was a verse that teaches we need to be uh, obedient and wise parents, there's one. But it also teaches you that they can turn from the wise and obedient parent. Oh, yeah. But, anyway. Okay, so Chuck, whoever, since... Um, go ahead, Linda. Hang on. Whoever closes us in prayer needs to remember to pray for Adele. Her surgery is actually on Friday, and they are hoping to be online on Sunday, is what she told me today. What, Amen. what is she Amen. having done? She's having a knee replacement. Knee hip replacement. Hip replacement. Hip replacement. Hip replacement. Hip replacement. Hip I thought it was a total. Scary though. Hey, if Pat can do it, Adele can do it. I remember watching Pat walk through the doors, right? You remember that night? When she walked through the doors of the church after having two knees replaced? Yeah. This is Adele's hip. Yeah, that's what I thought, hip. Oh. Hip. He oh. is. And believe it or not, a hip is marginally easier than a knee. Um, I've heard that multiple times. I don't want to replace. I want my head to be replaced. I want. I want the doctor to jack up my head and give me a new body because the rest of it hurts. <laughs> it does body transplant. Yeah. <laughs> I just need a heart transplant so that I can be more obedient. I pray for a Jesus all the time, and he keeps it's, saying, "You've already got it. Use it." Well, yeah. the the trumpet sound is going to the trumpet will sound soon. 
and then we'll all have new bodies. Thank you. And on that, Chuck, after you're done yawning. <laughs> Listen, this has been not dull for you to be sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, we pray for our sister in Dallas. We pray as she's uh, facing her surgery, that uh, you would give her peace of mind, peace of her heart. Lord, we pray the night before surgery, you give that surgeon a great night's sleep uh, so that his mind is clear. We, we ask uh, for her recovery very quickly. We thank you that they can still be a part of our congregation, though they're even in another country. Lord, we thank you that here we've got uh, 10 different locations, uh, 12 people uh, sharing together a couple different states. It's mind boggling, even in my lifetime, to think that that would have happened or could happen. Um, Lord, we ask your blessing. Uh, may we put to um, to use some of the understandings of your word uh, that we've shared tonight and how we dig and we question. Um, and let us do that constantly. Let us dig into your word. Let us, let us question to make sure um, that we're uh, properly parsing it. Lord, give us a great week um, this week. Keep us safe um, as we gather again on Sunday in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. I always appreciate good questions and, and hard discussion. I, I like I to have full contact theology. Say that again, Sandy. <laughs> I love you all for being my family. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you're here with us. I am too. I've been God blessed.